Hey everyone, Rizzo here, and today I wanted to upload a little preview of The Road Reviewed. Now, some of you may know that I already uploaded the segment on 5 a month or two back, but that was before my hard drive corrupted. You know, the hard drive that had all progress of every video I've made in the last 6 years. Yeah. So now I've made the hard decision to completely start over and revamp the video's presentation. That leads into why I'm uploading this segment. i genuinely like to know what you all think of the presentation changes. This project is made for me as much as it is for you. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I really hope you enjoy it. Take care. And now we finally come to the Beast from Beyond. This is a map I utterly eviscerated when I made my original review back in 2017. But with time, does it fare a bit better? Well, let's get into it. Starting off the positives with the very beginning, the cryptid opening rounds. Almost everybody I've seen play this map has voiced their... distaste for these rounds. But personally, I really like them. Give me a moment to explain! Because of how weak you are in zombies compared to Extinction, you have to play a lot more defensively than you did previously. Couple this with the close quarters map design, and these rounds can get fairly intense without director's cut. When I accidentally kill the last scout before putting Neil's head in, I feel a small sense of dread. Not in a, great, I have to fight more cryptids kind of way. More like, oh no, I have to fight more cryptids. They're challenging and make you consider your movements and, for the first time in a long time, ammo conservation. But even I'll admit, it isn't without the occasionally unfair death, since cryptids can now teleport into the play space out of nowhere. <gasps> the map's visuals. Unlike Attack of the Radioactive Thing, this map's visuals are very strong. And even better, they're varied. For example, the destroyed version of Willard's Theater makes great use of fire and darkness that help it stand apart from the Zeta Outpost's very cold, mechanical, well-lit environment. And then there's the Mephistopheles Boss Arena, which, despite a very low-resolution skybox, still looks and feels completely different to the other parts of the map. Along with the strong and distinct visuals, the audio is also quite varied. Each area uses vastly different background audio. The outpost utilizes sounds of computers, hissing gas pipes, and high winds, whereas the theater feels more barren, with the only real audio being that of the teleporters and raging infernos outside. I feel like these visual and auditory distinctions help the map feel much grander than it actually is. On the story side of things, it's actually not too bad. To a point, though. After defeating the mammoths, our heroes are transported back to Willard's theater, where he proclaims that we've finally done it. Naturally, our heroes are pretty miffed about all this movie nonsense and take the revenge on Willard by throwing him into Spaceland. But the problem comes in with just how conveniently vague all of Wyler's dialogue is in this scene. Don't you understand what has taken place? You have no idea the magnitude of what you're dealing with! You must listen, or all hope will be lost! You'll only make matters worse than they already appear to be! Countless souls are at stake! We must work together! Ah! It immediately pulls me out because I'm just screaming at my television, just say it's the devil, just tell them the devil's behind everything. If the dialogue wasn't so convenient here just to get the plot rolling, I would have liked this scene a lot more, as I really like the twist that all of our film excursions have actually been trials by Willard to find people strong enough to finally defeat Mephistopheles. That's a really neat twist that, in the context of the story, actually makes a lot of sense. As for the map's extinction elements, the introduction of the Zeta Corporation is actually intriguing and effectively builds on Extinction's lore in a way that could push the franchise in a new, interesting direction. Or, it could all be forgotten to focus on even more zombies. Because we don't have enough of that. With their introduction comes a canonical reincorporation of the Venom X and two new variants, the Venom Y and the Venom Z. Silly names and terrible unlock method aside, these variants actually feel like organic extensions to Extinction's original universe. Okay, this is a bit nitpicky, but I really would have liked to have seen the biolum change color depending on the variant like it did back in Extinction. But that's a little thing, so we'll move on. And then there's the returning cryptids. Despite simplifying how the cryptids work, it's still good to see them again. And they're easily my favorite of this map's special enemy types. Now, I know you're probably going to call me crazy, but I really do think they complement the map unlike the other enemies. For starters, the cryptids actually fit into the style of the map, but more importantly, the map's design feels like it was made with them in mind, and then they just stuffed a bunch of other enemies in at the last minute. 
Close quarters are the natural hunting grounds for cryptids, after all. The new wall weapons. I love almost every single one of them. The Proteus, DCM-8, VR rifle, and the G-Rail. Well, I love the G-Rail, but only when I have the full auto variant. But the best new weapon is easily the VPR SMG. This is one of the best weapons in the entire game. Seriously, it remains effective into the early 40s, has a great design, sounds fantastic, is well animated, and the excessive kick values make it feel like a really hard-hitting, powerful weapon. And of course, I saved the best for last, the Mephistopheles boss fight. I was initially very harsh on this fight, but since then I've discovered that that was simply because I was mad cause bad. This is actually a really good boss fight, and probably the best in Zombies history. Unlike most other boss fights, the boss is the actual threat here, not the copious amounts of zombies. The worst example of this would have to be both Shadow Man boss fights. You can kinda forget about Shadow Man in those fights, but in Beast, if you forget about Mephistopheles for a second, he'll ruin your entire day. This is a fight that requires laser focus and rewards players who pay attention to all attack cues, such as animations and sound design. The only thing that goes against this is the final phase, where the game just starts throwing a bunch of special enemies at you, which can lead to some really cheap deaths. But until that point, this is an incredibly well-designed fight that is something you can actually feel yourself getting better at, even if you're like me and have never actually been able to beat him. Plus, the entire fight is the most metal thing outside of the new Doom games. And now for the little things. When rave zombies walk in front of this lamp in the theater, their body paint can be seen. Neil returns from Spaceland and is voiced by none other than the man, the myth, the meme, David Hasselhoff. Although it's a bit weird that the Zeta Corporation is still using a face that looks like it belongs in the 1980s. Reminder, this map takes place in the 2200s. The map reuses certain assets and materials from Extinction. It really is a little thing, but it helps the universe feel a bit more consistent to me. What better place to start than the most easily identifiable flaw of the map? The fact that there is almost nothing in terms of actual content. Like the Darkest Shore, besides killing zombies and completing the main quest, the only thing that there really is to do is get slash upgrade the Wonder Weapon, which, just like the Darkest Shore, is kind of obnoxious. Oh well, I'm sure that it's just a coincidence that every DLC 4 since Revelations has felt unfinished or rushed in some way. I'm certain of it. Speaking of rushed, let's talk about the return of Samantha Cross. When people found out that Ali Hillis would be returning to voice Cross in the new Zombies map, I was really excited. With the project head of Extinction, the lead writer, and Ali Hillis all on board to continue the story, it seemed like all four of us Extinction fans were in for a real treat. Now we'd finally get to find out what happened after Exodus. Well, we did, and it's just the worst. Let's recap. In her 80 second reprisal, Cross tells us what happened after the events of Exodus, but is constantly interrupted by convenient damages to her transmissions. I was never able to thank Godfather for. It was saved mankind. What I've personally been able to gather is that after Cross was relocated to the Exodus station, Godfather did something that helped lead to the destruction of every Ark on Earth and the complete eradication of the Cryptid Scourge. My best guess is their doomsday plan, the Scorched Earth policy introduced in Awakening. Billions lost their lives because of this, including Godfather, but mankind's total extinction was prevented. Yet Cross can still sense the ancestor's presence somewhere, waiting for the perfect moment to strike, just like they did in the original story. After the destruction of the cryptids, the Exodus shuttle is lost to space and crash lands on the ice planet. After this, Cross gets chilly and dies. Then Zeta comes in, about 200 years later, and like the company they're clearly inspired by, Wayland yutani wants to do stupid shit with aliens. You're gonna love this. The higher-ups want the outpost employees to take the cryptid specimens they found and bring them home. Excuse me, what? Do you remember what happened last time? Now that we're caught up, let's dissect why I feel this wrap-up just doesn't work. The entire point of Exodus was to establish that we lost the war. Godfather even flat out says this, twice. Give me options, General. What'll it take to win this war? The war is over, sir. We lost. The citadels of a prehistoric empire that once spanned the globe 
and will soon do so again. So as a species, we literally only had one option left retreat to space, and maybe one day, our descendants could fight back and reclaim Earth. This map wants us to believe that despite all that talk of defeat, Godfather secretly had a plan, we somehow won, and Cross didn't wipe out humanity, despite everything about the ending saying otherwise. They believed my power could make the difference between survival and extinction. They were right. Yeah, no. I can swallow tough pills like Blood of the Dead completely ruining the mystery of Alcatraz, but this is way too much. Adding to this are the story inconsistencies, and it all just crumbles in on itself. And as for the Scorched Earth policy, I always took it that this globe view was showing us that in action, since the Sif team's Osprey is still en route to the Exodus launch site. Has Scorched Earth been retconned to take place after the Exodus launch? Or was that always the case and this outro is just weird? Either way, things don't really line up and it's super disappointing. But despite the poor conclusion to the original Extinction canon and lack of content, there's one thing that's far more detrimental to the overall product. Something that sinks the map far more than poor writing ever could. And that is, of course, the special enemy balance. It is horrifically broken in the later rounds. After the third or fourth special round, every type of enemy can potentially be on the field at once. Clowns, cryptids, slashers, zombies, and the dreaded ninjas. Yes, like exo-zombies, each special enemy type does have a gameplay counter, but just like that mode, when they're put together, their strengths make it next to impossible to effectively counter others. Cryptids and slashers are enemies that require you to run away and get a safe distance, as their attacks are fairly powerful, but the ninjas completely contradict this bit of gameplay. To counter ninjas, in theory, just don't sprint. But like I previously stated, you pretty much have to when cryptids and slashes pop up. Reminder that two slashes can be on the field at once, by the way. This creates a completely broken gameplay meta where you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it leads to a lot of unfair deaths. Unlike some of Zombies' previous game design nightmares and the nightmares of the future, I feel that there's actually a few pretty simple ways to keep the map challenging, but fair. My first idea would be to take the health of the ninjas that appear in special rounds and apply it to standard gameplay as well. For context, ninjas in the special rounds can be put down with a single headshot, but if you don't hit the head, they still have a lot of health. In theory, this would make it so that while they are a surprising and deadly enemy, a quick player with sharp aim could put them down with a well-placed headshot. Another way would be to prevent certain enemy types from existing on the field together. That way, their strengths wouldn't combine and screw over the game balance, but you could still have a challenging experience that kept you on your toes. Now, I don't pretend to know everything about game design, and I'm not here to say, Lee Ross, fix your game because I said so, but it's pretty apparent that ninjas should not be able to spawn alongside cryptids and slashers and vice versa. One last thing that kind of compounds this issue is just how bad the lost and found spawns are. If you go down on a higher round and the game decides to spawn you on the other end of the map, all I've got to say is, Good luck getting through the special enemies with only an OSA. And God forbid a slasher be on the field. Now for as much as I've dogged on the poor balancing, I actually had the pleasure of talking to Lee Ross about this very subject back at the Black Ops 4 reveal. I asked him, in a very kind way, not like pushing on him like an angry fan or anything, why Beast was made to be such a brutally difficult map to play. And he told me that the team wanted to create an experience that kept even the most skilled players on their feet at all times. Now, it's obvious that I don't think they succeeded at doing this very well, but at least I understand what they were going for. And now, you do too. That's something that I feel is very important, attempting to understand the creator's point of view, even if you don't agree with it. But let's address the mammoth in the room. Is this a mentality I've adopted just because I started becoming chummy with and talking to the devs in the last year? I'll let you decide. But the answer is yes. And lastly, the cryptid boss fight is kind of weak. The game locks you into a small room and just throws a bunch of cryptids at the player, only to follow it up with two of the most obnoxious bullet sponge bosses since Warzone firefights Warden Eternal. Can you respect my families, please? I know I used that bit last time, but it amuses me, so yeah, that's my excuse. The main problem I have with the mammoth fight is that it simply goes on for far too long. The core idea of the fight is solid. The closer you get to killing the boss, the less room you have to maneuver around the already tight arena. But sadly, that's all it is. 
a great concept killed by outstaying its welcome. This last bit was something I brought up in my original review, and while I still find that segment amusing, it's ultimately more nitpicky than anything. Good thing I have the nitpick section now. So, without further ado, I present to you every single little thing the devs messed up, changed, or flat out forgot about how the cryptids worked in Extinction. That's a much kinder title than last time. Number 1. Scouts Don't Sprint The running animations they use in this map were previously only used by hunters. Number 2. The cryptid behavior is significantly less dynamic in certain regards. In Extinction, cryptids would run on walls and attempt to stalk the player by keeping their bodies low to the ground. In Beast, these behavioral traits are lost, and they just run at you with no nuanced movement. They do still jump at least. I guarantee that these were discarded because, in combination with zombies, no deployable armor, and a 3 hit down system, it would likely make the gameplay meta far too chaotic. Number 3. The cryptid textures are significantly lower quality than they were in Ghost. Previously, all cryptid textures were 4K on PC and next gen consoles, whereas in The Beast from Beyond, the color maps are 2K and the emissive maps are 1K. In layman's terms, the normal textures are half of their original quality, and the glow textures are a fourth of their original quality. Number 4. Cryptids should not spawn in via teleport. Cryptids have always been a species grounded in reality, if admittedly a slightly heightened one. Whether it was through a hole in the wall, crawling under fences, or bursting through concrete, they would always spawn in in a realistic way. Now they just teleport in for no reason, which can cause gameplay issues, because if you're red screened and a cryptid just so happens to teleport in front of you, that can obviously be a bit frustrating. Number 5. The phantom effects have been remade and the trail effect is gone. In Extinction, when a phantom jumped, there would be a slight trail effect that keen-eyed players could use to track its movements. Number 6. The mammoths in the final battle are mammoths in name only and bear little resemblance to their originals. They no longer burrow underground or call in reinforcements. Now they're just blue rhinos that bleed napalm. Personally, I believe that the mammoths as they appear in the final battle are a product of time constraints. If the team had more time, I think they should have and probably would have given these traits to a new cryptid species. As an extinction nerd, I would have loved to have seen a new, never before seen cryptid species burst out of the Zeta containers in the final battle. That could also be a way to open up the lore for extinction a bit. Now bear with me because I'm about to get a bit fanficy. To explain away why they weren't extinction, these proposed new cryptid types were not native to Earth because the cryptids actually originated from somewhere else deep in space, as some fans believe due to point of contact's loading screen, and Earth was just a new place to conquer that they took a liking to. Then it could be written in that when the Exodus station was lost to space, it landed on the ice planet and Cross's arrival ended up somehow awakening a hibernating cryptid colony. Then, in 2199, while exploring deep space, Zeta tracks the signals emitting from the Exodus station, finds Cross's body, stumbles upon the cryptid colony, and retrieves a new cryptid species. Just a thought. Nerd. <laughs> no. The Beast from Beyond is easily one of the most frustrating maps I've ever played, and that's because there was so much potential here to make something truly great. While there are some things to like about the end product, it's very hard to appreciate them because the map's gameplay meta is so broken that it's borderline unplayable. When you get killed by something you literally could not fight, like a ninja zombie teleporting directly in front of you while you're red screened, that's a problem. As for the story, I've said before that a game's writing can make the difference between something good like Gorod Krovi and something great like Mob of the Dead. But at the end of the day, if it isn't fun to play, the story doesn't really matter. It just so happens that both of those elements in The Beast from Beyond are weak. And as an Extinction fan, that is just disappointing. 